Okay, so here we are on chapter 17, food, a very important topic for all of us as human beings. Um, so uh, let's not only deal with the uh, delicious aspects of food, but uh, let's uh, look at the scientific aspects as well. In this chapter, we'll identify dietary carbohydrates and state their sources and functions. We'll identify dietary lipids and state their function. Uh, we'll list the essential amino acids and explain why we need proteins. And we'll describe some protein deficiency diseases and their causes. We'll also identify the vitamins and the bulk dietary minerals and state their functions. We'll describe the effects of starvation, fasting, and malnutrition. We'll list some commonly used flavorings and foods. Uh, we'll describe the historic impact of our desire for a variety of flavors and aromas and of our search for sugar substitutes. And we'll also identify the beneficial additives in foods and those that are somewhat controversial. And finally, we'll define the GRAS, GRAS list and food additives allowed under its provisions. We'll identify and describe some of the main problems with harmful substances in our food. And uh, finally, we'll describe how green chemistry has made the extraction of natural products, bioactive food components, and essential oils from plants safer and less hazardous. So keeping with our theme of uh, ending with a green chemistry topic on this chapter as well. Okay, so can't stress enough the idea that the food we eat is made up of chemicals. Foods are chemicals. Uh, everything in the universe that's stuff, that's physical matter, is a chemical in nature. Uh, and so we uh, get particularly um, far away from this idea with foods because of the idea of natural and organic. And uh, these, these terms mean something different in chemistry than uh, in everyday speak. Organic, for instance, we talked about organic chemistry a few chapters back, and uh, we discussed it being the chemistry of carbon containing compounds. Uh, aside from a few uh, exceptions where carbon is considered inorganic, uh, the hydrocarbons, for instance, were our first class of organic compounds. Um, and that's not what we mean when we say organic with foods. We mean no pesticides and things like that. So we have to be very careful with our language, and we also have to be very careful to remember that foods are chemicals, and uh, we need these chemicals. They're not bad uh, in and of themselves. Uh, taking too much of fat, for instance, could be a bad thing. Uh, but the uh, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, along with the water, vitamins, minerals, and fiber that the foods contain uh, are neither uh, bad nor good. Uh, they're all necessary in some amount, but if you take in too much, then there are problems with any of those things. So um, hopefully we can keep that perspective as we, we move along to talk more about these uh, foods that we eat. Okay, so if you're like me, you're after the monosaccharides. These are the simplest sugars. We talked about these um, monosaccharides in particular last chapter when we did biochemistry. Uh, but glucose, which is also known as dextrose, um, it, it's not terribly sweet on its own. Um, probably uh, the only people out there who may have had pure glucose are diabetics or uh, pregnant women who've had their glucose tolerance tests. Um, Fructose, a fruit sugar, that one uh, most of us have had, uh, it's the sweeter component of honey. Um, and then disaccharides like sucrose, table sugar, uh, that's very common. And I would wager to say most of us have enjoyed that particular sugar. Uh, and these are what give that characteristic sweetness to things like fruits uh, or, um, in the case of sucrose, uh, uh, any number of baked goods and um, so if you're like me and you love your sugars, you just have to be very careful about uh, overconsumption. Um, glucose in particular is an important sugar in the body, but we don't want to take in too much. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, many of us do that. So uh, again, the monosaccharides and disaccharides tend to be the, the sweeter components of food, uh, and they tend to add a lot of flavor, but they also come at a cost if we overindulge. Uh, so looking at the carbohydrates in the diet, uh, digestion and metabolism of carbohydrates are uh, very well-known and well-studied processes. Uh, and glucose and fructose, for instance, are absorbed directly into the bloodstream. Glucose is the only fuel that the brain can use. Um, so these are important things that we do need some of. Uh, sucrose, the disaccharide we mentioned previously, it, it gets hydrolyzed into glucose and fructose. It's also known as invert sugar when you have the glucose and the fructose. Uh, 
uh, that come from the sucrose. And honey is an example of uh, glucose and fructose that uh, are uh, present together. Uh, these are good fuels. They're important fuels. Uh, they're uh, well-known biological uh, pathways. Um, and uh, some people who take diets like the Atkins diet, where you get very little sugar, um, that, that can cause its own host of problems like ketoacidosis, uh, having too many ketones and, uh, and acidity of the urine, for instance. Um, so, uh, as I said before, moderation, uh, having some of these things in the diet seems to be very good. Having too much of anything in the diet has negative impacts. Uh, looking at another sugar, lactose, which is known as milk sugar because it's found in milk, uh, at least mammal milk, right? Uh, almond milk and coconut milk wouldn't have lactose, but uh, cow's milk, for instance, or goat's milk or sheep's milk would. Uh, if that's hydrolyzed to glucose and galactose uh, for those of us who still possess that enzyme. And uh, some people are just born without the enzyme. Some people lose that enzyme uh, with age. Uh, certain ethnic groups are, are less likely to have it. In particular, African-Americans and Asians may have uh, lost the ability uh, to uh, produce that enzyme uh, either at an earlier age or uh, may never have had that, poss that uh, enzyme capability. Um, that's a condition known as lactose intolerance, and um, it unfortunately has a lot of negative uh, side effects if a person with lactose intolerance ingests lactose. Um, it can cause diarrhea and upset stomach and all sorts of, of problems. Uh, so fortunately, there are products now, um, not only the almond milk and the coconut milk that I mentioned that aren't really milks in terms of having lactose, but there's lactaid uh, products that have uh, the protein and uh, other components of the milk, but the lactose removed uh, so that lactose intolerant uh, individuals can enjoy them. Um, as we see at the bottom of our slide, sometimes babies lack that enzyme and uh, they need synthetic formula. Uh, so even the mother's breast milk would still have that galactose uh, from the um, uh, lactose being acted upon. Uh, either they wouldn't be able to produce it or they wouldn't be able to convert the galactose to glucose. Uh, so uh, that would be obviously a problem. Unfortunately, we do have uh, things like soy-based formulas that wouldn't have any lactose and would be useful for uh, babies suffering from that galactosemia issue. So the mono and disaccharides that we mentioned, those would be considered uh, simple carbohydrates. We also have the complex carbohydrates. These would be your starches, uh, for instance. So starch and cellulose starch are polymers of glucose, as we mentioned uh, back in the biochemistry chapter. Uh, they're connected by alpha linkages. Um, most animals and humans have the enzymes necessary to hydrolyze starch uh, to glucose, and then the glucose obviously can serve as a, a source of energy. Um, carbohydrates like starch, uh, or the simple sugars as well, have four kcals of energy per gram. Uh, cellulose, on the other hand, which is also a polymer of glucose, um, that one's connected by beta linkages, and uh, like most other animals, humans lack the enzymes necessary to hydrolyze cellulose, so we can't burn it for food uh, or as a source of fuel, but it is a, a good source of roughage or dietary fiber. It provides bulk and, and keeps things moving through the digestive system, so even though we can't digest it for energy, uh, we do still make good use of that cellulose, and it's important that we do get uh, sufficient uh, roughage in our diet to keep everything moving along as it should. Now, oftentimes, uh, animals like us uh, get uh, a lot more glucose than we can use immediately, and so we can store it. Uh, we can make what's called glycogen, which is sort of the um, animal starch, as it's sometimes called. Uh, it's a much more branched uh, polymer with alpha glucose uh, compared with plant starches, uh, but it serves uh, its purpose and it uh, allows us to uh, store some uh, glucose for later use. If we have a lot of excess glycogen, uh, then we would tend to store it as fat. And fat's not bad, it's just a long term storage uh, system. And uh, if we end up having too much fat because we're con constantly taking in too much glucose or other sources of glucose, uh, then we can end up with an issue because we have um, more fat reserves than we could really use and uh, all sorts of uh, health issues that go along with having that excess fat. Uh, 
uh, as we see, sometimes you have um, bacteria in the guts of uh, termites, for instance, which we know uh, can be wood-destroying insects, and also grazing animals like cows uh, that can hydrolyze cellulose to glucose. So uh, that allows these animals uh, to get cellulose as a source of food, uh, whereas cellulose, as we said, for humans uh, would be really just a source of dietary fiber or roughage. Okay, so if you're thinking back to the previous chapter on biochemistry, uh, recall fats are esters of uh, fatty acids and glycerol, triglycerides as we called them back in that chapter. Uh, and so some of the fat is metabolized for energy. And if you notice, compared with the carbohydrates, which give 4 kcals of energy per gram, fats uh, produce 9 kcals of energy per gram. So uh, fat is a, a very valuable way to store high energy molecules. Um, some of the fat is necessary for cell membranes, some is used to make things like cholesterol and other uh, important uh, hormone uh, precursors. So we do need some fat, and, and uh, trying to eliminate all fat from the diet is not a healthy idea, but uh, excess fat, taking in too much fat uh, or way too much sugar that gets converted into fat uh, on a long-term basis is a very dangerous situation. All right, so the digestion and metabolism of fats. Uh, fats are digested in the small intestine, and we have enzymes called lipases that hydrolyze the triacylglycerols into mono- and diacylglycerols along with fatty acids and glycerol itself. So um, if we're not going to be burning these fats for that 9 kcals of energy per gram, uh, we can store them in uh, what's called adipose tissue uh, in locations called fat deposits. And fat deposits are located around major organs uh, beneath the skin. Uh, and, um, you know, we, they tend to be in the places that uh, humans tend to uh, expect their fat deposits. Men and women store things slightly differently, but uh, by and large, it's, it's uh, those fat deposits around the major organs so that you have that energy source right by the, the place that might need it. Uh, and uh, if you've ever uh, looked at, at um, other animals, if you've uh, happened to do any dissection or even just, you know, preparing uh, meats for food, uh, you'll notice that there's a fair deal of fat around those uh, organs and uh, the, the uh, major tissues that surround those organs. And here we see an example of a triglyceride, a fat, uh, and uh, that... Uh, fat is acted on by lipases in the presence of water. Of course, in biochemistry, there's always lots of water around. Uh, and we see here, in this case, we get uh, two oleic acid molecules and a palmitic acid uh, residue along with the glycerol if we go to the total uh, digestion of this particular tri triglyceride. So again, to reiterate, it's important to get some fat in the diet, and as we said, fats are useful for making cell membranes and other important uh, biological needs, uh, but dietary fats and cholesterol, uh, when uh, consumed in excess or with a family history, uh, have been implicated in arteriosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. Uh, and uh, the reason that the fats uh, are associated with these two uh, processes are because there are deposits called plaque that form on the inner walls of the arteries uh, in both ar arteriosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. And uh, as you see in the picture, that can narrow the artery uh, and uh, impede the, the flow of blood. And, and obviously that's a negative impact in, um, in cases where diet alone isn't enough to, to um, halt or reverse this. There are a number of uh, drugs that can be prescribed to help people uh, from uh, forming any more significant deposits in their arteries once this disease is discovered. So how do we know if someone might be suffering from one of these uh, conditions? Well, uh, the plaques that clog the arteries are rich in cholesterol. And cholesterol is uh, a fat-like steroid molecule. It's a lot of these fused rings, if you uh, think back to organic chemistry. Uh, and it's common to animal tissue, um, and cholesterol is important. It's, it's a precursor to uh, some steroid drugs, and uh, uh, steroid uh, molecules, rather. Uh, and it's carried in the blood by lipoproteins, and uh, 
these uh, lipoproteins are classified according to their density. So you have the very low density uh, lipoproteins, the BLDLs, that transport triglycerides, and then the low density lipoproteins, LDLs, carry cholesterol from the liver to the blood and are responsible for the formation of the plaques. And so the LDLs are therefore known as the bad cholesterol because they're associated with the processes that uh, cause the clogging of the arteries. Uh, the HDLs, high density lipoproteins, carry the cholesterol to the liver and therefore are called the good cholesterol uh, because they're uh, solving that problem of uh, the cholesterol uh, being in the blood. So uh, oftentimes uh, cardiovascular disease will first be diagnosed by the uh, HDL and LDL levels uh, and then maybe uh, there'll be some sort of uh, technique used to uh, image the circulation and uh, if those deposits are found, like in our previous slide, um, depending on uh, the extent, perhaps they can do what's called angioplasty, where they can just blow up a balloon and uh, try to uh, impact the walls more and, and open up those vessels or uh, perhaps replace vessels, uh, depending on the extent of damage. But it's typically the first step is to get these LDL and HDL levels to, to see if someone's at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. And so we see here in table 17.1 from the text, the VLDLs, the very low density lipoproteins, have a, a very low percent protein, about 5% protein, and therefore uh, quite a low density. And their main function is to transport the triglycerides. The LDLs have uh, much more significant protein content, about 25%, and therefore higher uh, densities. And they transport the cholesterol to the cells for use. And as we said, they tend to be the ones associated with these deposits. And then the high-density lipoproteins, HDLs, uh, they're half protein. Uh, so they have very high densities relative to the other two types. And uh, as we said, because of their function of transporting cholesterol to the liver for processing and excretion, they tend to be called the good cholesterol because they're getting that cholesterol out of circulation. Okay, so as, as we already said, those uh, high LDL levels uh, can be problematic, uh, and those are typically associated with diets high in saturated fats, and in particular trans fats uh, have been linked to those high LDL levels. So limiting the amounts of saturated and trans fat in one diet, one's diet is uh, recommended in those cases, and really for anyone. Uh, trans fats um, are made by that synthetic hydrogenation uh, that's uh, been around for quite a while now, uh, although the link was just recently discovered. Uh, and now, uh, at least in the U.S., uh, manufacturers have to list the amounts of trans fats in their products. So suddenly, uh, most uh, manufacturers just stop using them or use such small amounts they don't have to list them, uh, and instead they're using uh, either uh, fully saturated fats or uh, naturally unsaturated fats instead of taking those unsaturated fats and partially hydrogenating them to make the trans fats. They're either fully hydrogenating uh, or just uh, keeping the uh, natural unsaturated fats, which is good, and, and that's good that the uh, manufacturers have gone that route, although they did have to be shamed into it by having to declare those amounts uh, on the uh, packaging. So, uh, again, the trans fats... Uh, are the products of hydrogenations uh, used over 100 years ago to make margarines or to just try to get those fats more solid. Um, Crisco, for instance, is a product that uh, has still lots of trans fat in it because you just can't replace it. It's uh, The only way to make it is by hydrogenating some of those uh, unsaturations to give the partially hydrogenated fats. Um, and as long as you're not too concerned or you don't eat too much of it, it's probably not bad, but uh, having too many trans fats, especially if you're someone who uh, has a family history or is predisposed to these um, high LDL levels, uh, it's probably not a good idea. And so we see here uh, on this slide an example of saturated. Uh, a is fully saturated, all uh, carbon, hydrogen, uh, or I should say carbon uh, single bonds, either to hydrogen or carbon, just the one carbon-oxygen double bond at the terminal end of the uh, on, uh, the fatty acid there for the saturated fatty acid. For B, uh, we see a trans configuration because the, um, the hydrogens are on opposite sides of that double bond, if you want to think about it that way, and therefore the carbon groups are on opposite sides. Uh, finally, in C, we see the cis configuration where uh, 
the carbon groups are both on the same side of the double bond. Uh, and that looks like it would be uh, the uh, wrong way for nature to put things together, right? B looks better to us in terms of symmetry, uh, and B is what's preferred when we do chemistry on these uh, unsaturated fatty acids. But truly in nature, uh, C, the cis configuration, is preferred, uh, and our bodies uh, by evolution have evolved to prefer this cis configuration and uh, unfortunately we don't uh, know what to do with that trans configuration as well so when we get a lot of it it tends to contribute to those high LDL levels and then the arteriosclerosis or uh, coronary disease uh, that we associate with those so uh, cis is the way we as humans have evolved to handle our unsaturated fatty acids saturated fatty acids they're not good for you in large amounts, but they don't have the cis-trans problem because there's no carbon-carbon double bonding in the saturated fats. Okay, and on to our last um, type of macromolecule that's uh, potentially used for uh, fuel, the proteins. So proteins are digested into individual amino acids in the body, and then these amino acids can be used to make new proteins for growth and repair of tissue or for any of the other hosts of functions that proteins can serve in the body. Uh, the human body can synthesize all but nine amino acids necessary for protein synthesis. So these nine amino acids are therefore called essential amino acids because we have to get them out of our diet. And they include isoleucine, lysine, phenylalanine, tryptophan, leucine, methionine, threonine, and valine. So uh, these amino acids must be consumed by the diet um, and uh, those of us who uh, eat animal flesh or milk or eggs uh, tend to be able to get uh, all of those amino acids uh, in any of those products. Uh, but uh, the vegetarians out there, especially the uh, vegans who don't eat even the milk or the eggs of animals, uh, have to be careful to balance their proteins uh, because not all of the uh, plant sources will necessarily have all of those essential amino acids. And if you're lacking any of those amino acids that are essential from your diet, then uh, you could be um, subject to a number of uh, disorders uh, that uh, could be, um, you know, very uh, devastating uh, by not allowing for uh, proper protein synthesis. Okay, so as we see here, the so-called complete proteins contain all those nine essential amino acids needed for growth or repair of tissue. Uh, so lean meat, really any meat, but obviously since we already talked about fats, the lean meat is better. You can have a little fat, but don't need to uh, be eating excess fat. Uh, milk, uh, fish, eggs, and cheese uh, all contain those complete proteins. And of course, they're all animal sources. Uh, so as I, I said already, the vegetarians have to be careful. Um, you know, legumes tend to be a good source of, of proteins uh, when balanced with other uh, grains and other uh, sorts of uh, vegetables for, for a vegetarian diet. Just be careful that you're getting all nine of those amino acids if you choose to live that vegetarian lifestyle, particularly the vegan lifestyle, which again, there are lots of health benefits from that, uh, but uh, potential health problems if you're not balancing your proteins. So the human body has a requirement of about 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So remember kilograms uh, there would be 2.2 pounds to a kilogram. So if you take your body weight in pounds and roughly take half of that for your kilogram mass and then multiply by 0.8, uh, you would get your uh, daily protein requirements. Uh, if you're not getting enough protein, uh, you might suffer from protein deficiency, which can lead to uh, stunted growth and development, discoloration of the skin and hair, a swollen abdomen, um, and again, that protein deficiency could uh, result from just not taking in enough of those essential amino acids. Even if you're getting enough protein overall for this 0.8 grams per kilogram, uh, if you're not getting the right blend of proteins, you could still suffer from these uh, issues. And unfortunately, as we see in our picture here, they tend to be associated with the developing world. So um, places where uh, people don't have enough to eat or don't have uh, a, a rich variety of diet that would allow for uh, the meat or animal products that have the complete uh, proteins or uh, the blend of uh, plant products that would allow for that as well. So uh, we tend to uh, unfortunately see this more in the developing world, but we're not immune from it here in the U.S. And if you're not careful with your diet, you could uh, start to see yourself suffering from this protein deficiency.
All right, so in addition to all those important biomolecules that tend to be organic in nature, the proteins, the carbohydrates, and the fats, uh, there's also a lot of important inorganic chemicals. Um, dietary minerals, for instance, are the inorganic substances necessary for life. And uh, if we think about the bulk structural elements and the macro minerals, uh, they make up more than 99% of all the atoms in the human body. Uh, trace elements and ultra trace elements make up the rest and those uh, are, tend to be the um, inorganic components that we need in very small amounts but uh, without them we just can't perform necessary life functions. So we see here in table 17.3 uh, all these different um, important chemicals uh, and the uh, structural elements uh, tend to be those um, hydrocarbons or uh, carbon with heteroatoms, uh, these tend to be things like the proteins that we talked about that, uh, as we said, they're organic uh, biopolymers. Uh, we also have the macro minerals, things we need lots of, like sodium, although sometimes we get uh, too much, even though we need a lot, uh, a lot of us get an awful lot in our diet. Uh, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chlorine, as chloride ion, uh, all of these are the ion form, by the way. Uh, phosphorus is uh, dihydrogen phosphate, and then sulfur is sulfate. Uh, those are the macro minerals, and then the trace elements, things that we need, although not very high quantities, uh, and they also tend to be as ions. Um, iron, we need a fair deal of because uh, it's so important to the hemoglobin molecule, uh, but it's still considered a trace element. Copper, we need for certain enzymes, uh, zinc as well, and then ultra trace elements, we need in very, very small amounts. Uh, and we also need them in specific forms. So uh, chromium, for instance, uh, we're not quite sure the form that's used, but chromium-6, uh, which is the chromium-6 plus oxidation state, uh, can be very damaging. So uh, we probably use the chromium-3 plus and 2 plus or some combination thereof, uh, but uh, the uh, higher valent chromium-6 can lead to cancers and other undesirable. So uh, we have to be very careful because uh, some of these other things that we need a little bit of, uh, cadmium, for instance, uh, can be very toxic in large amounts. So lead, it looks like we might need a little bit of lead 2+, plus, but uh, too much, uh, as uh, unfortunately we've seen throughout history, can lead to uh, mental deficiency. The Romans uh, seem to uh, be consuming far more lead than they should have, and some of their emperors made some pretty... Um, questionable decisions, uh, possibly as a result of that lead uh, interfering with normal function. So the ultra trace elements, we need very, very small amounts and we need the right form. Uh, too much or the wrong form can be uh, very uh, toxic for life. Okay, so just like a deficiency in, in the uh, biomacromolecules like proteins, uh, lack of dietary minerals can have serious consequences. And in particular, iodine deficiency uh, can lead to thyroid go goiters, as we see in uh, the individual pictured here. Um, if inadequate uh, iodine is obtained in the diet, then uh, these large goiters can form. Um, other symptoms include uh, just slow uh, metabolism um, associated with low iodine. Um, and um, again, for certain indigenous peoples, this is um, important. Uh, one uh, group was uh, given supplemental iodine uh, at one time in an aboriginal society, uh, and then uh, there weren't enough resources to support uh, the people when they were functioning at normal thyroid levels. So strangely, uh, in developing areas where uh, the land just can't support uh, fully functioning um, metabolism, uh, the iodine deficiency actually helps to uh, have the people uh, coexist in the environment. Uh, but for modern uh, industrialized nations, uh, iodine deficiency should be fairly easy to treat. Uh, we iodize salt. Uh, and that's one way that people can get uh, additional iodine in the diet. But uh, again, if, if you're not uh, taking in enough or you don't buy the iodized salt, for instance, uh, or you're buying all your food as uh, pre-salted and they don't use iodine uh, as a supplement, uh, then iodine deficiency can and does happen even in the um, United States. So in addition to the minerals, we have vitamins. Vitamins are the organic compounds that are essential uh, in the diet. Uh, so 
the vitamins are not proteins, fats, carbohydrates, or minerals. They're different. Uh, they uh, can be classified as either fat-soluble, things like vitamin D, for instance, uh, or water-soluble, things like vitamin C, for instance. So the fat-solubles can be stored. The water-solubles you have to take in uh, on a daily basis because they uh, would be excreted uh, with the urine due to their water solubility. And here we see a couple fat-soluble uh, vitamins. So retinol is a form of vitamin A. Uh, and you can see it has a lot of unsaturations, carbon-carbon double bonds, as well as that ring. Uh, and that gives rise to a fairly nonpolar uh, molecule, which is uh, therefore soluble in fats, which are largely nonpolar. Uh, you do have that OH group at the uh, extreme right end. That gives a little bit of uh, uh, affinity for water, but not much when you've got that huge fatty portion of the molecule and just that one OH group. Uh, likewise, vitamin D2, uh, which is uh, based on cholesterol structure, it has that OH group at its extreme left end in this picture, but again, compared with all of those CH groups uh, throughout uh, and the unsaturations, it's uh, much better uh, solubilized by fats, nonpolar uh, fats, or a nonpolar molecule like vitamin D2. And we see here some structures of various water-soluble vitamins. So at the far left, ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Uh, you see multiple OH groups as well as some oxygens there. It's a carbonyl as part of like a cyclic ester there. Um, and uh, the other OH groups as well, giving lots of water solubility. Uh, nicotinic acid and nicotinamide, some of the B vitamins there, uh, which have the uh, nitrogens in the rings as well as the... Um, carboxylic acid in the case of nicotinic acid, or the uh, amide uh, in the case of nicotinamide, the am amide uh, linkage there, uh, good water solubility for these relatively small molecules, uh, and uh, those hydrogen bonding sites allow for uh, even greater enhanced uh, solubility with water. And we see here a table uh, listing the vitamins by fat soluble, so uh, vitamin A, D, E and K, examples of uh, fat-soluble vitamins and their sources, uh, as well as any deficiency disease or condition that might result from insufficient quantities of those vitamins in the diet uh, or by supplements. Uh, and then we have the water-soluble vitamins, so in the, the B vitamins, as we see a number of B vitamins there, as well as vitamin C uh, and the different uh, deficiency diseases or conditions. Uh, so uh, scurvy there for vitamin C, uh, as uh, you may have heard before. Um, unfortunately, a number of other um, issues with uh, the uh, deficiency in any of the other vitamins. And we see a couple of uh, very severe deficiencies uh, that can lead to serious side effects. Uh, so here in uh, the picture for A, uh, softened bones due to vitamin D deficiency. So uh, this individual, as you can see, the bow legs and the uneven uh, leg length even, uh, is due to just insufficient vitamin D uh, in the diet, or vitamin D actually can be made if you get uh, sufficient sun and you have cholesterol. Uh, the um, synthesis of vitamin D uh, in sunlight uh, can occur, but uh, if either you're in a region like ours that doesn't get a lot of sun in the winter months, uh, or if uh, you uh, are very faithful about putting on your sunscreen, it's actually those um, low uh, wavelength rays from the sun that, that can do that uh, chemistry. So uh, you're actually preventing that from happening. And therefore, most of us who either use sunscreen a lot or live in uh, regions that have uh, short daylight periods for some of the year or both um, have to... Uh, make sure that we get sufficient vitamin D. Vitamin D is added to milk, for instance, in the United States to, to prevent those softening of bones. But uh, it can be a severe deficiency and, and with very serious side effects. Uh, in the photo B, we see uh, an individual suffering from pellagra due to niacin deficiency. So one of those B vitamins that uh, he wasn't uh, consuming in sufficient quantities uh, through his diet. And uh, therefore, we see that uh, skin disease as a consequence of that vitamin deficiency. We mentioned dietary fiber up when we talked about cellulose, but again, uh, it's an important part of the diet, um, and that dietary fiber may either be soluble or insoluble fiber. Um, the insoluble fiber is what we talked about when we mentioned cellulose, which is the primary component. 
Um, solu soluble fiber, on the other hand, is mostly gums or pectins. Um, so if you've uh, ever uh, done any uh, canning or jarring of jellies, you probably use some pectin. Uh, gums, guar gum, for instance, is added to a lot of different uh, foods to get the right texture. Um, th it's important to get both insoluble and soluble forms of fiber in your diet because of the benefits. It helps to maintain proper colon function. It keeps things moving along in that digestive system. Uh, and it's also uh, believed to help with controlling blood sugar and lowering cholesterol levels and uh, just overall good health uh, from sufficient dietary fiber. And along with fiber uh, is water. Water is probably the most important part of our diet, whether we think about it or not. Uh, water is a part of most food and beverage that we consume, uh, and it's a, a key part of our diet, and it's uh, most of what we in ingest if you uh, look at it by mass. It's mostly water. Um, in addition to all the water we get in our foods, we also need about a liter to a liter and a half of water daily. Uh, in order to just maintain healthy skin and uh, healthy uh, digestive function. Uh, water is just uh, an amazing substance and uh, most of us don't get enough of this critical component of our diet. Uh, so starvation and fasting. Let's talk first about starvation, which is defined as the total deprivation of food. Uh, as you can see, it takes less than one day for the body to deplete itself of glycogen stores. So we don't have a whole lot stored up for quick energy as glucose. So the, remember, the glycogen is that highly branched animal starch. Uh, and so we have just about a day's reserve of that. Uh, after that glycogen is depleted, if you go on to another day of starvation, the body will start to metabolize fat reserves. Uh, and this sounds great, right? We're using up that fat. Most of us uh, wouldn't mind losing a few of those pounds. Uh, but the problem with fat metabolism is that if it's extended uh, for any length of time, it leads to ketosis because we have these ketone bodies that get released into the blood and the urine. Uh, and that can lead to acidosis as the blood pH drops. Uh, so um, this is something that uh, people who have tried the Atkins diet or these diets that involve essentially no uh, sugars, uh, all protein and fat, um, that they can get what's called ketoacidosis, where they have low uh, blood pH and low urine pH as a result, and that can be a very dangerous situation. Um, finally, if, if it goes on, uh, body proteins will start to be metabolized, and, and eventually muscle proteins will be metabolized. And if you recall, proteins now have that nitrogen uh, as part of their structure, whereas the carbohydrates and the lipids don't have any nitrogen. Now we've got a nitrogen component, and that's not going to uh, be metabolized as cleanly. The proteins and the amino acids should really be used for structure and uh, functional uh, activities in the body, and they're not uh, desirable as uh, fuel. So uh, it's very uh, devastating uh, after just a day or so when we've depleted those glycogen stores, uh, moving on to day two and starting that fat metabolism and finally uh, protein metabolism uh, can be very taxing on the body and obviously starvation uh, can't go on for very long without uh, long-term effects or ultimately death. All right, and so we see some of these ketone bodies. One of the classic uh, ketones is acetone. Uh, which 2-propanone is its official name, but most of us know it as acetone, its common name, uh, and it's the simplest ketone. Uh, we see we also have acetoacetic acid uh, and beta-hydroxybutyric acid as some other ketone bodies uh, that uh, result from uh, starvation, uh, over a day of starvation that leads to uh, tapping those fat reserves and, and uh, increasing these ketone bodies and ultimately as you see the, the two lower cases are uh, acids uh, and can lead to that ketoacidosis that we talked about. So malnutrition uh, is a term that we use for uh, a different uh, issue and that's not that you're starving. So starvation has to do with uh, not getting those um, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins uh, in your diet. Malnutrition can happen even when you're eating plenty of food, and, and uh, like in the U.S. where we have lots of overweight individuals, they can still be malnourished because they're eating lots of processed foods that have the sugars and the starches uh, and the fats uh, and even the proteins that we need, but not everything that we uh, really uh, need to take into our diet, especially uh, processing food uh, typically removes a lot of the fiber. Uh, 
uh, and other nutritional value like vitamins and minerals. So uh, it's uh, ironic, as our slide says, that people in developed nations like ours experience obesity and poor nutrition uh, while living in the land of food abundance and, and um, taking in plenty of calories but not getting quite everything they need from their diet. Uh, and uh, this affects children as well as adults. Uh, and malnutrition is a big problem in the United States and worldwide, but uh, particularly in a, a country like ours that, that has the resources uh, and the knowledge. It's unfortunate that we still experience malnutrition at the levels we do. All right, so food additives. Food additives, as you see on the slide, are substances other than basic foodstuffs added to food as a result of production, processing, packaging, or storage. Uh, so this goes into those processed foods in particular where um, a lot of emphasis is based on keeping it shelf stable. Um, for instance, uh, you have the uh, dressings, the salad dressings, um, and Kraft made big news when they said that they were going to make an all-natural salad dressing. Uh, chemists in particular were uh, intrigued by that because one of the things that uh, has been added to those dressings to uh, keep them looking nice on the shelf years and years later uh, is EDTA, ethylene diamine tetracetic acid. Uh, and it's not natural, it's, it's a synthetic uh, substance. Uh, and that's what uh, binds to a lot of these um, ions like iron that might uh, get oxidized and start to make it look bad, particularly a uh, creamy ranch dressing that you'd want to look uh, sort of whitish uh, would uh, get, uh, you know, a rusty color to it if we didn't have this binder, this EDTA. And so we thought that Kraft found a natural alternative to this, and they were making their all-natural dressings. And, of course, the all-natural dressing contains EDTA. So it's such a small amount, they don't consider it to be uh, affecting that all-natural status. But uh, as a chemist, uh, we think they, they cheated. So uh, just be careful. It, I, we don't think that EDTA is, is harmful in any way, but it's just unfortunate that... Um, you know, it's added there just for looks so to keep something shelf stable for a long, long time. Uh, if we look at some other things, sugar, salt, corn syrup, citric acid, so on and so forth, uh, make up more than 98% of all those additives by weight. EDTA would make up less than 0.1% by weight. Uh, so uh, it's not something that's uh, even considered uh, by Kraft as, as uh, running contrary to their all natural claims. And some of these additives actually improve the nutrition. So these are good things that are added to the, the food. So, for instance, uh, KI, uh, potassium iodide, is added to salt to give iodized salt. And you have to be careful because they do sell uh, plain old NACL that doesn't have the uh, potassium iodide added. Um, so uh, the uh, potassium iodide salt uh, is the iodized salt that you might buy, and hopefully you do buy because uh, that does help to... Um, allow better thyroid function and prevent the goiter that we saw several slides back. Uh, vitamin B1 is commonly added to polished rice. Uh, you have vitamin C added to fruit juice and other beverages. Uh, vitamin D is added to milk to prevent rickets, that uh, picture of the softening of the bone we saw from the vitamin D deficiency. And vitamin A is added to, mar uh, to uh, margarines to match the nutritional value of butter. So these are all good improvements, uh, things that uh, make the food even more helpful. And here we see a number of uh, flavoring agents that are food additives. So uh, looking at the extreme left top, we have uh, methyl anthranilate, and that is a grape flavoring. Uh, and then we see we have our oil of garlic, diallyl disulfide, uh, benzaldehyde is uh, oil of bitter almond, uh, vanillin is uh, vanilla uh, flavoring, eugenol is uh, oil of clove, and then we have two uh, options, menthol or menthone for oil of peppermint, and uh, finally cinnamaldehyde is oil of cinnamon. So lots of uh, flavoring agents to give those uh, deep uh, flavors that uh, we might desire in a food but uh, might not be naturally present. All right, and we see here a number of artificial sweeteners, uh, and some of them uh, have uh, had their controversies. Uh, the very first one we see, sodium saccharin, uh, was taken off the market for a number of years because of the uh, impact, I believe it was on uh, rats, uh, 
that were pumped uh, with very high doses of it uh, did develop some uh, tumors, non-cancerous tumors, uh, and so it was removed from the market, but then uh, later on it was decided that it was safe and it was added back. Uh, so uh, saccharin, as it's normally called, has uh, quite a controversial past, past because of that uh, short-term uh, ban on its use. Uh, and then we see some other options, uh, a lot of things today. Uh, steviol, the bottom left, uh, is from the stevia plant, and uh, that's an interesting one that tricks the body into tasting sweetness. Um, and that's considered a very natural option and is very popular and expensive as a result. Um, sucralose uh, is another very popular one nowadays. Um, but uh, again, a lot of these other ones, aspartame, I think we talked about back in biochemistry, is being an accidental discovery, uh, but they all um, have that uh, sickly sweetness because they're actually sweeter than sucrose that they replace. So that's one of the drawbacks. And we see here in table 17.5 a relative sweetness comparison. And so if we're looking at sucrose, uh, sucrose would be considered a one. That's what we tend to think of as our ideal sweetness. Uh, fructose is even sweeter. Uh, fruit sugar, as it's sometimes called, is, is almost twice as sweet as sucrose. Glucose, not quite as sweet. Maltose, much less sweet. Lactose, not very sweet at all. Uh, and then if we start to look at some of these uh, alternatives, uh, steviol glycoside, for instance, 30 times the sweetness of sugar. Um, aspartame, 180 times. Um, sucralose, 600 times. Uh, neotame, 13,000 times. So it gets very difficult to bake with a lot of these alternatives because uh, you're not using nearly the quantity uh, that you would of sugar. So aspartame in particular is, is a very light molecule uh, and it doesn't substitute well in baking because you need the bulk of that sugar. Sucralose uh, seems to be a little better uh, in terms of that. It, it tends to be uh, something that you can use because it is a larger molecule. You can use similar amounts in baking, uh, but some of these just don't stand up to baking like uh, natural sucrose does. So uh, it's it's tough to get that um, balance between the sweetness that you want uh, and the um, non-calorie aspect of these artificial sweeteners. Uh, we have other types of flavor enhancers, so we're not specifically targeting sweetness here. Uh, typically, we're going after that savory receptor, that umami receptor for things like monosodium glutamate, MSG, right? And that we see glutamic acid, and then we see MSG uh, has uh, the sodium uh, form uh, of the uh, carboxylate group on the far right. Uh, and um, this is uh, problematic. Uh, if, if you consume large amounts, uh, it can be harmful. It's been shown to cause birth defects if eaten in large amounts by pregnant women, for instance. Uh, and uh, I know myself, if I have had uh, MSG-laden foods, uh, I'll get a headache. And it's just, it, it, it's nice while you're eating it, but there are side effects. And in particular, if you're a pregnant woman, you would definitely want to make sure that uh, you were not eating uh, any significant quantities of MSG for fear of harming that uh, unborn child. Another common food additive is a spoilage inhibitor. So here you'll see things like antimicrobials that will prevent spoilage from molds, yeasts, or bacteria, uh, propionic acid, sorbic acid, benzoic acid, and their salts can be used. And so we see a very common one down at the, the far bottom uh, sodium benzoate uh, is a common additive. Uh, it's the sodium salt of benzoic acid, and it does uh, keep things from spoiling by, um, you know, uh, having that antimicrobial activity. Um, it's a very small amount, and it doesn't seem to have uh, too too much in the way of uh, health effects, but uh, it is something that's unnatural. It's a food additive uh, that, that's there to extend the shelf life of these processed foods. Uh, we see a spoilage inhibitor here, a sodium nitrite uh, is commonly added to cure meats and give that pink color to ham, hot dogs, bacon, and bologna. Um, unfortunately, stomach acid will convert that nitrite ion to nitrous acid, which can then react with amines to form nitrosamines, uh, which are known carcinogens. So uh, if you do enjoy cured meats, uh, and, and many of us do, and, and uh, there's no reason to cut them out of your diet altogether, but you certainly would want to limit them. Uh, so you wouldn't want to have, you know, um, several servings of, of 
these in a week. A hot dog might be a once a week treat or bologna, uh, but you don't want to have hot dogs and bologna and bacon and ham every single day of the week uh, or certainly not multiple times in a day uh, if you're concerned about that carcinogenic uh, nitrosamine that might be created. Uh, sometimes uh, we add antioxidants to foods to uh, keep them from uh, going rancid. And BHA and BHT are two examples of common antioxidants. Uh, and they're typically added to foods that contain lots of fats that could turn rancid uh, as these uh, fats uh, react and form free radicals. Uh, the antioxidants will scavenge those free radicals and keep the free radicals from damaging the fats and causing that rancidity, uh, rancidity rather. Um, and so uh, butylated hydroxytoluene, BHT, and butylated hydroxyanisol, a BHA, uh, as well as tert butyl hydroquinone and propyl gallate are some common antioxidants. And they, they uh, again, tend not to have ill effects for humans uh, and uh, can uh, be very helpful to uh, extend the shelf life of uh, high fat foods that might otherwise go rancid pretty quickly. And so here we see some structures of those uh, various substances. The BHT, uh, we see there BHA, it can have that uh, methyl group in uh, either the ortho or the meta position uh, to the OH group, for instance. Uh, and then we see propylgallate and uh, tert butyl hydroquinone uh, for their chemical structures. So commonly you see these OH groups that might be able to scavenge those free radicals and stabilize uh, the free radical uh, before it damages the fats to make uh, the fats go rancid in these products. Nutrition is just one of those areas that uh, the more you know, the more questions that uh, arise. Uh, so uh, the idea of poisons in our food uh, is not a new idea. It's, it's been around for a long, long time. And unfortunately, most of those poisons are naturally occurring. Um, so uh, some of it, uh, as we just saw, the nitrites, for instance, uh, can give rise to those nitrosamines that are uh, known carcinogen so uh, that nitrite uh, sodium nitrite is an added uh, substance that gives rise to uh, potential carcinogens but a lot of the things that we consume have natural carcinogens and uh, it's estimated that the natural carcinogens are present at 10,000 times the rate of the synthetic carcinogens uh, so uh, we see that uh, you know sometimes these uh, natural carcinogens uh, are uh, substances that are present in nature and, and uh, not anything we can avoid other than avoiding that food, uh, but there's probably some other health benefits that may negate the um, carcinogenic impact of, of some of those natural carcinogens. So uh, just have to be informed and, and uh, choose wisely when you decide what you're going to eat and where you're going to get it from and what's been added to it uh, from the natural raw state to the time that it gets to your table. Uh, sometimes things end up being added to the foods unintentionally, so we call these incidental additives, and they get into food accidentally during production, processing, packaging, or storage. And so there are about 10,000 incidental additives that end up in our food, uh, and uh, some of these uh, have been caused for concern, rightly so, uh, for uh, LR, it's a uh, breakdown product, is dimethylhydrazine, which is a suspected carcinogen, so that's obviously something we don't want in our food. Um, PCBs, PBBs, antibiotics, DES, etc. Um, I know a lot of uh, places locally, uh, the uh, milk now is being pledged by the farmers to come from cows that have had no uh, antibiotics uh, given. So the antibiotics doesn't uh, end up as a, uh, a leachate, an incidental additive to the food, to the milk that's produced by those cows or the dairy products that might be made from that milk. Um, so again, that's sort of the honor system, uh, but it is a, a step in the right direction that the farmers have pledged not to use those antibiotics unnecessarily, uh, where it used to be routine that farmers would give the cows antibiotics just to keep them well. Uh, nowadays, that's not being done, and the far less of the antibiotic residue is ending up in the milk. So um, just raising awareness of these additives can uh, lead to, to changes in behavior and uh, improvement in food quality. So as we wind up our discussion here of food, um, the idea of food additives, is, as scary as some of them may seem to us, uh, they're probably a necessary part of modern society. Uh, 
Each year, we see there's uh, 76 million illnesses in the U.S., including 5,000 deaths due to bacteria, viruses, and parasites in food. Um, and uh, few, if any, of these deaths are associated with the use of these intentional food additives. It's uh, typically things that happen to the food if we're not careful uh, to uh, make sure that it's cooked to an appropriate temperature uh, or uh, that there have been appropriate precautions taken. Uh, that tends to be where the problem happens, or the food preparation, in particular fast food restaurants have, have been uh, in the uh, spotlight for uh, some of the um, mishandling of food or uh, inadequate washing of food or hands. Um, so uh, in, in terms of uh, green chemistry, we did talk about the idea of uh, not using uh, food additives that are unnecessary. Uh, we just talked about the incidental additive of uh, uh, the antibiotics in milk, for instance, and uh, that uh, idea that it's not necessary to use, it doesn't seem to uh, decline milk production significantly to move away from that culture that previously just uh, fed antibiotics in with the feed uh, to our current culture of uh, not giving antibiotics unless necessary to those cows. And uh, so that's an example of uh, a food chemistry triumph and uh, again, the idea that food additives uh, will uh, be a part of uh, food uh, processing, uh, but not an unnecessary part. If we uh, have evidence to support that it's not useful or necessary, then we move away from it or we find a safer alternative. So uh, hopefully we haven't made you too hungry in this discussion of food, but uh, maybe enhanced your uh, idea of uh, what goes into feeding people in modern society.